الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما غلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم أما بعد نحييكم بتحية الإسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله I greet you all with the greetings of peace and blessings from the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, uh, it's great to be with uh, my brothers and sisters in the Medina Institute and uh, have a class at Medina Institute in Cape Town. We have, alhamdulillah, about 90 students. I'll be missing that class this week, so I was telling them that uh, I'm missing this particular class, but I'm not missing Medina, because I'll be doing another class for Medina Institute in Malaysia, so I'm not out of the institute, you know, so, so alhamdulillah, so, and, I, and I've taught uh, at the Medina Institute in Canada, uh, excuse me, Atlanta, USA as well, Canada also has one now. Um, maybe I will go teach there also, you know. There's one in the UK as well, there's one in Norway as well. Uh, but the main two Medina Institutes are in uh, Cape Town. That's the main one actually. Uh, it's got about 90 students and it's like now we have the fourth batch of students this year. We already graduated um, 70 to 80 for the last three years per year. So, uh, and then another, uh, the second main branch of Medina Institute, uh, is the one in Atlanta where Sayyidi Sheikh stays. And it's interesting and proudly, proud, and I say it proudly that although he stays in Atlanta, the Medina Institute Cape Town was the forerunner. And the, the Atlanta one followed the Cape Town one, although he lives in Atlanta. So we set, you know, the, the standard, alhamdulillah. Um, but that is also for many reasons, uh, because in Cape Town we have a strong tradition of Islamic knowledge, love for Islamic knowledge, strong tradition of Sufism, Tasawwuf, uh, and so on. Uh, whereas in the USA, these things are still very premature, uh, very lacking. There's still a lot of opposition to a lot of it. There's a lot of ignorance. So people are still, you know, finding their way there. But nevertheless, uh, there's the institute in Atlanta as well, Alhamdulillah. I've been teaching there for the last three years as well. So, and now uh, at Medina, Malaysia. So it's great to be under the banner of Medina because it is the banner of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's al Medina. So, this hadith that we will be focusing on is from Medina. It happened in Medina. So let's go back to Medina, 1400 years ago, when our beloved Prophet وسلم, made the hijrah to Medina, established his masjid, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that city for him. He didn't choose it himself. And when he came inside Medina on his camel, as the camel was walking through the streets of Medina, the alleys of Medina, and the children, the boys and girls of Medina were singing Tala al Badru alayna min saniyat al wadai to welcome him. And I always call that the first Mawlid. They sometimes uh, they ask me, uh, was there Mawlid in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I said, yes, there was. When he came into Medina, wasn't everybody singing Tala al Badru alayna and beating the drums and all that? That's the Mawlid. So uh, as he was walking, uh, he was riding on his camel and and everybody was pulling his camel towards their direction. Because it goes past the homes of people. Everybody was standing out at, at the door of their home, and outside their homes and introducing themselves. So, Salaam alaikum ya Rasulullah, because in line, I am so and so and from this tribe. And, and she said, please, and they tried to pull his camel. He come, come to my house, have a, have a rest here, have a break here, have a meal here. So... The Prophet ﷺ, when he saw them pulling his camel like that, he said to them, He said, leave it, 
for it is guided by Allah. He said, leave my camel, for it is guided by Allah directly. Not even by himself. He said, it is directly guided by Allah. So even he was not guiding the camel in any direction. And then the camel went on walking. And then it by itself stopped at a certain spot and sat down. So I always say that uh, today we have cars with GPS, but uh, you cannot beat the camel of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That was the, the, the divine GPS. I mean, uh, the car was guided directly by Allah subhanahu wa taala. The camel was guided directly by Allah. And you know, there you cannot go wrong. The GPS on your car can go wrong sometimes. But if your camel is guided by Allah, it can never go wrong. So it sat down. Uh, it sat down and uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, This is where it sat down. This is where I will establish my masjid and my home. So he will live next to, you know, his, his home will be attached to the masjid. And then he asked them, uh, what is this place? So it had sat down in front of uh, uh, a yard that was uh, uh, just an open yard, like a yard where they used to have, they used to, like what they call a junkyard, you know, nobody lived there, it was just a yard. And in it they used to dry their dates. They used to put a lot of dates there to dry and they would have all these branches of date trees laying their dead branches and so on. So it was people just used to just keep some things there. Um, it wasn't really used for living purposes. So he asked, who does this belong to? They said it belongs to two youngsters from our tribe. Called uh, uh, Sahal and Suhail. So they, he said, call them. They came. Yes, salam alaikum wa rasulullah. And they were believers, mu'mineen. MashaAllah, we, we believe, ya Rasulullah, you're honored. And he told them, Allah has ordered me to build my masjid here. So please uh, uh, sell this land to me. If you can, sell it, then I, I, or I would like to buy it from you, this, this land here. So they said, uh, before they can say anything, the tribe, the chiefs of the tribe were all there. And uh, these two boys were orphans, meaning their, their father was dead. So the chiefs of the tribe said, uh, yes, uh, we, uh, uh, no, he said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, you can take it, we gift it to you. We gift it to you, we don't want uh, uh, any money from you. So he said, no. I will ask, um, I want the permission of those two boys. He asked them, he said, no, you cannot speak for him. He told them, you must tell me the price of the land and I will pay for it. So they said the same thing. They said, we would like to gift it to you, Ya Rasulullah. So he insisted, he said, no, I will not take it as a gift. I will buy it. So there was a little bit of a discussion there. I actually don't want a fan. Huh? Yeah. I just that's what I said earlier. <laughs> I think he misunderstood me. You know? <laughs> but anyways, uh, uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So there was a discussion uh, on the whole thing. Uh, and he insisted that he will pay for it. And uh, in the end they agreed and they gave him the price. I said, okay, well, this is the price. And then he وسلم, bought that land from them. And at that time he didn't have enough money to pay for that whole land. So he borrowed some of the money from Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. From Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He borrowed some money from him. Which he paid him later on. And uh, he bought that land. And then it was cleaned up. They took all whatever was laying there and they cleaned the whole place up and they started building his masjid there and the parameters of his masjid were set by Jibreel himself. 
Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and showed him the parameters of how the masjid should be exactly and showed him the direction of the Qibla. Because they didn't have compasses at that time. So it was all based on guess, guesstimates. So when they were arguing which side is the Qibla, sallallahu alayhi sallam said that way. And somebody asked him, you know, how do you know? Are you sure? He said, Jibreel alayhi salam has shown me that way. So the Qibla was made and uh, it took them six months to finish his masjid and his rooms next to it. And at that stage, two rooms were built next to the masjid. For, uh, he asked for two rooms to be built because of his two wives. Sayyidah Sauda and Sayyidah Aisha. Uh, Aisha was not yet married to him at that time, radiallahu anha, but she was engaged to him. Because she was going to be married soon. So he asked for two rooms to be built. One for Sauda and one for uh, uh, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha. So that was the Masjid al-Nabawi, the blessed mosque of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It was a very simple structure made of mud bricks. Uh, the roof was just, uh, first of all, most of it didn't have a roof. Only a quarter of the mosque had a roof, the front section. The rest of the mosque was open. Only the front had a little bit of a roof there. And that roof was made of uh, old date trees. And when the date tree dies, you know, they take these, these long you know, trees and they just put them on the top there and made them as roofs. And uh, that roof wouldn't cover them from rain, for example. When it would rain, then it would leak. And uh, the masjid had no carpet in it. It was all sand. Just like the beach. Just sand, clean sand. So when it would rain, uh, it would become muddy. And uh, so much so that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa when he makes salah, during the rainy time, then he lifts up his head and there is mud on his nose and mud on his forehead because of the leaking and so on. Uh, at a later stage, uh, I think it was in the Prophet ﷺ's time or say in Umar's time, uh, they ordered uh, small pebbles to be put, thrown throughout the mosque so that it doesn't become too muddy because the pebbles are there on the sand. The carpets only came later on, much, much later on. So, one can even say carpets are a bid'ah. Uh, but uh, as you can say, there is bid'ah hasana and bid'ah sayya. There is a good bid'ah and there is a bad bid'ah. You know, a good bid'ah is that which is a new matter, but it doesn't uh, contradict anything in the deen. And it is for the benefit of the deen. You know, the benefit of the Muslims. And the bad bid'ah is also something that wasn't there before. And it is a negative influence. It's harmful to the deen or to the believers. So uh, the carpet, therefore, we have carpets in all our masjids today. In the Prophet ﷺ's mosque, his entire life, there was no carpet in his masjid. He prayed on the sand. So somebody was arguing with me about bidah, bidah, bidah. So I said, if you want to get rid of bidah, then first you must remove the carpet from the pray on the sand. Why, why you only focus on one or two things? You know, you... You like you pick and choose certain things. That is bidah, this is bidah. Then if you want to know really want to do it the full way, then you have to remove the carpet from the masjid. Uh, you have to remove the mihrab. You have to remove the mimbar. You have to uh, all these things. You have to, uh, uh, if you're going to do it like that. Uh, even the calendar, Sharia, Islamic, Assalamu alaikum. Islamic calendar, uh, Rasulullah's lifetime there was no Islamic calendar. Sayyidina Umar introduced that. Anyways, so uh, we go to uh, the Masjid al Nabawi. Why I'm talking about the Masjid al Nabawi is to set the background for the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. So, what exactly is the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam? The beloved Prophet وسلم, used to sit in the masjid. He used to perform his five salawat in the masjid, obviously. And then he would sit in the masjid after the salah often. And the sahaba, radiallahu anhum, they used to sit around him. And that majlis would have such adab. 
The Sahaba, they described it later on. They would say, "Kunna nahli qahoola Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kaanna ala ruusin al-tayr." He said, "You would sit around the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so respectfully, as if there were birds nesting on our heads, and we don't want them to fly away." Right? Because if, what that statement means is that you would be so still, frozen. Because if you are moving like that, a bird cannot nest on your head. It means you, they, you'll be so frozen, you know, and, and our heads would be lowered. So we wouldn't stare at him in the face. La nanzuri la wajhihi. He said, except for Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. So they used to look at him and smile, and he would look at them and smile. So, you know, they would, uh, the other Sahaba, they would just catch glimpses of him, but they wouldn't like stare at him in his eyes and so on. They would sit quietly with their heads down. So this khushu and adab that we have in the majalis, especially the majalis of the great awliya and salihin, that is coming from the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, that is, uh, you know, the more prophetic the person is, the more adab we have around them. And that is also some of the things we have lost in our times. The adab of the majalis. You know, you know, you, you sometimes go to certain majalis or certain masajid and we find that uh, before anything else, people have no adab of sitting in a majlis. You know, uh, it's, uh, the khushu is not there, the adab is not there. So all that has to be there. That's all part of the sunnah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So they used to sit around him very respectfully, and most of the sitting of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to be uh, in the posture of uh, the tashahud. When we recite the tahiyatu lillahi wa sallam, the qada, when we sit down in salah, uh, he used to mostly sit in that posture. Mostly, most of the time, he used to sit in that posture. In fact, in the last year of his life, he was nearly all the time sitting in that posture. And he would say, that is how a slave sits. And I am the slave of Allah. So that is the shiddatul hudur. How he is present with Allah. Because when the slave would come in front of the master, he comes, he sits like that. Yes, sir. You know. So Rasulullah is, is he's so much in Allah's presence all the time. And he is experiencing and feeling that presence that he would sit most of the time like that. He would not even lean on anything. Today we are leaning, right? I have something I can lean on, you have something to lean on. He wouldn't lean on anything. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, uh, even when he had a chance to, you know, but he wouldn't. He would say, I sit like a slave. So, uh, the slave will not lean, right? If the slave is in front of the master, he does not lean on anything. He goes, just like that, yes sir. So, it just shows the khushu and the khudu of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was... He was the most fearful of Allah from his creation. The most knowledgeable one of Allah from his creation. And the most conscious of Allah from his creation. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was not somebody who just preached, you know, and not practiced. You know, he was the whatever he preached, he was the one practicing it the most, more than anybody else. If he was telling the people to fear Allah, he was fearing Allah the most. If he was telling people to be conscious of Allah, he was the most conscious of Allah. If he was telling people to worship Allah, he was the most worshipful of Allah. Uh, the Sahaba testified to that. They, they, they described him like that. That he was the most pious. He used to order us to have taqwa and he had the most taqwa from all of us. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So uh, they used to sit with him and sometimes they would sit around him quietly for long periods of time. Sometimes they sit for an hour from one salah to another salah. And they are quiet, they are silent. Nobody says anything. But uh, the everybody is in, then what is that? In today's world where everybody likes to talk, that type of thing sometimes doesn't make sense. Because everybody has an opinion today. People tell you, in my humble opinion, if you were that humble, you wouldn't have an opinion, you know, <laughs> in the first place. 
Yeah, I'm not talking about ulama and so on. I mean, I'm talking about people who are not qualified, but in my humble opinion, ya Sheikh. But why do you put humble there, ya Sheikh? If you were humble, you wouldn't be having opinions, you know. You would listen to what the ulama are saying. But anyways, um, nevertheless, I mean, we live in a world where uh, you can't even blame people because we live in a world where everybody is so opinionated, everybody is encouraged to have an opinion on everything. And tafkir is good. Thinking is good. We, we should all think. But uh, there is also something called expertise. There is something called qualifications. There is, there is something called people who have more knowledge than me. <laughs> so uh, we should not rush to opinions before we have studied properly. Yes, if you have studied for, you can say, you know what, I've been studying for the last 15 years, 10 years, at, le at least, let's say 10 years, I've been studying the deen for the last 10 years, then maybe, I, fine, I'll say, okay, maybe you can have an opinion now. But what we have today is when people have not, they haven't yet studied, but they're already having opinions. You know, uh, so that's very dangerous. We have to first study and, and absorb everything, and after that, fine, you can, you can have an opinion. And so on. But we live in a time where everybody is encouraged to talk. Everybody is express uh, themselves. Uh, and then such a gathering would not make sense. Why are they all just sitting quiet? But that's exactly the point. That silence, you know, if uh, speech is, is uh, silver, then silence is golden. In the modern world today, you find people having silent sessions. What they call meditation and so on, right? Modern people are doing it now. Uh, sit down, everybody sitting quietly. And sitting in that specific posture, you know. They have to sit in a specific posture and everybody is just silent and meditate. So, uh, unfortunately, most of that is happening with non-Muslims today. Not with the Muslims. Muslims are just too, too loud. <laughs> Around the world you see Muslims are too loud. Just shouting and screaming and takbir and Allah and this and death to this and death to that. And you know, uh, too much screaming and shouting, Muslims generally. You know. I'm not saying, I mean, there, there is a time for protesting and all that, but there's just too much of all that. Too much screaming and shouting. Too little silence and contemplation. And that's why there is no tama'anina. Allazina tatma'innu qulubuhum bi zikrillah. Allah bi zikrillah tatma'innu al-qulub. And I like the statement of the respected Dr. Uh, Abdul Hakim Murad. Of England, where he said that if your takbir is louder than your istighfar, then there's a problem. And I'll repeat that to just to absorb that because I read it seven years ago, but it sticks with me. You know, he said if your takbir is louder than your istighfar, you know, then we have a problem. Because usually, by what he means by that, I mean usually the takbir is against somebody. The istighfar is against your own nafs. Takbir, you know, you, 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 against somebody else. You know, it's very, it can be very, it can be a very egoistic thing as well. Can be, not always, but it, it, it could be an act of just pure egoism, arrogance, you know, against somebody else. But your istighfar is when you are hammering yourself. You know, and that is not easy. It's easy to hammer other people. Death to the Yahud, you know. People shout these type of things, you know. Uh, but istighfar is shouting death to my own nafs, death to me. Now that is very difficult to shout death to me. You know. So uh, Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad, people before they didn't shout too many other things. They used to make a lot of zikrullah, you know, loud. You know. Today we, we don't have that. It's going down. There is, it's there, but it's it's becoming less. We are more engage in all these other things. Uh, but anyways, uh, silence is very important. And Sidi ibn Atayullah said that if you cannot learn from your shaykh silence, إِلَّمْ يَنْفَعَكَ سُكُوتُهُ فَلَنْ يَنْفَعَكَ كَلَامُهُ If you cannot benefit from his silence, you cannot benefit from his words. If you cannot benefit from your shaykh's silence, you can't benefit from his words either. What does that mean? You know, it means that you have to learn that in the end of the day, both in the silence of your sheikh and the words of your sheikh, you are not benefiting from either. In reality, the benefit is from his hal. The benefit from, is from his state. 
so even the words he is saying, if they are coming from a, a true state, then they will benefit you. But if it is just mere talk, uh, they won't benefit you. I mean, we all go to talk and talks, right? There are talks you go to and even though it's a nice talk, it doesn't touch you, it doesn't have any transformative effect. Uh, it's just information, not transformation, as Sheikh Sayyidi Sheikh Ninavi likes to say always, right? Uh, and then there are uh, other talks you go to and it may not be too long and so on, but it has a profound impact on you. Why? Because it's coming from a hal. The qal is coming from a hal. And today we focus on the statements of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam but not on the state of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's why the statement is from the state. When the state speaks, it's a statement. You see the state, the hal becomes the qal. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, believe me, believe me, they benefited more from the state of Rasulullah than the statements. Yeah. And whatever benefit they got from his statements were also based on his state. The state in which those statements came. So the hal of the speaker is very important. Um, and, and then if it's the hal that's going to help you, then even when the sheikh is silent, the hal is still speaking. So the hal is still there. So that's what Ibn Atayla, CD Ibn Atayla means that you, you will benefit from his silence. Or even if you just go sit with your sheikh, your murshid, or your sheikh, or where you, your mentor, your guru, well, I don't care what you call it, you know, but you need to have that in your life. You need to have a mentor, a sheikh, a spiritual person that you, you know, okay, in modern times people like to call them master, my mentor, in the old days they used to call them murshid, sheikh, peer. Doesn't matter what you call it, you know, but. Uh, just to sit in their company and uh, the hal will benefit you. The hal will benefit you, you know, so uh, the, it's very important. The hal is transmitted. The ahwal, sahibul uh, hali la yakhlu minhu sahibu. Ibn Atayillah also says that uh, if you sit with somebody who has a certain hal, uh, the hal is contagious, that it, it, it will affect the people around him. I mean, the most simplest example is if somebody is coughing, you know, it's, or somebody is sick, you know, they, the more they are, the more it can affect the people around them. So that's a negative example, but this is a positive thing. So the hal of a person uh, does impact on people, and the stronger the hal, and that's why you find people saying, you know, I, I went to visit that sheikh, and I sat in his company, and uh, although he didn't speak anything, you know, we didn't talk, but I can just feel the power, and you know, it was, it was powerful. You know, we all experience that, we all... Uh, if not, then we must. <laughs> Somebody said, but I haven't experienced that yet, then, then you must, inshallah. It's very important. You know, uh, so, uh, yeah, that's the hal. So, Allah was alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidina Muhammad, uh, the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu used to sit in the company of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Often, nobody is saying anything. But they are just sitting with him. He is in muraqabat Allah, and everybody is in his muraqaba, which leads them to muraqabat Allah. Because as human beings, they won't immediately go to Muraqabat Allah because that's not easy. That's a higher state. Because it's ghaib. Uh, people usually like what they see, you know. But they will face Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their Muraqabat will be on the Prophet, on their Shaykh. But since he is in Muraqabatullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it will immediately tune them to Allah as well. And that is what they call the Fanaf al-Shaykh and the Fanaf Allah, you know, and... and People misunderstand these things and they say, oh, the Shaykh, why do people focus on the Shaykh? Why do you not focus on Allah? You know, as if focusing on Allah is that easy and that simple. <laughs> you know, it's not that easy or not that simple. You, know, um, you have to learn how to be focused on Allah from somebody who is focused on Allah. So first, which inevitably means, first you have to focus on them. If you want to be focused on Allah, and that is the goal, of course. The goal is not a sheikh or anyone, you know. Those are just, the goal is Allah, anna ila rabbika muntaha But to be focused on Allah, you need to first focus on somebody who is focused on Allah. To learn from them. Simple example, if you want to learn how to play soccer, you can't focus on the ball, ya akhi. You have to first focus on those who are playing the ball. Okay, very simple and, and very timely example also, you know. 
So you have to you focus on the players or a player, a good player, you know, and and, and you see how he plays it, you know, and then you learn. So um, if you want to know how to make muraqabatullah, you first have to focus on somebody who is in muraqabatullah, and eventually that will become you. you know. So that is the purpose of the suhbatul mashayikh, suhba of the, of the people of Allah, people of the ahwal, arbabul ahwal. And here you have to distinguish between ulama only and awliya. Ulama and awliya. And, uh, which, and although they are not exclusive terms, because an ulama can also be awliya at the same time. Many awliya are also ulama at the same time. You know. But not always. Not always. You find the ulama, but they are not awliya. In fact, most ulama generally, most are not awliya. They are just ulama. That's it. They're good people, pious people, but they are not awliya. They are not people of hal. Uh, or at least not a hal of such a level that can impact on others. Maybe they have, everybody has a hal. Every Muslim has a hal. The most worst Muslim also has, he makes a dua, Ya Allah, forgive me before I drink this khamar or after I drink this khamar. That's a hal he has, you know. But it's too weak to impact anybody, you know. It's, it's just making him survive. So, there are most ulama, not awliya, you know. It's a fact. Um, and many awliya also are not ulama also, you know. In the sense that they are not qualified muftis and so on, but they are awliya. But you get ulama who are awliya as well. The point I'm trying to make is that... Uh, if you want the hal uh, and experience what I'm talking about, you have to be in the company of awliya and not just ulama. Or at least you have to find those ulama who are also awliya. This is a very important point. I'm not talking about celebrity speakers and famous orators and, and Famous personalities that give nice lectures and that's fine, alhamdulillah. And that's all connected to Hadith Jibreel, the level of Islam and Iman. But the level of Ihsan, you have to find those who are awliya. You have to find them, you have to look them. There's no shortcut, ya akhi, ya ukhti. There ain't no shortcut. You have to look for them. And you know what, Google has made it easier. I mean, although I'm not saying find your sheikh on Google, you know. But I mean, you know, it's so easy today. I mean, you know, you go, you look, and, and who said you can't find your sheikh on Google? Who said you can't find your sheikh on? You can find. Uh, the thing is, if your heart is sincere, you will find him wherever you need to find him. Allah will, you know. Uh, you know, you you might just type Sufi, you know, and maybe the first sheikh that comes up, maybe that's that is your sheikh. Doesn't matter. You know, somebody find the sheikh in the jungle. Somebody just walked in a gathering and they saw a sheikh. Somebody got a sheikh that came in a dream. Uh, a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we have to search for the people of Allah and I know the modern people don't like these type of things you know we believe we are in a post awliya you know uh, generation you know uh, there's just no such thing you know every generation of Muslims we have to look for the awliya Allah we have to look for the people of Allah so that we can also become people of Allah so that we can learn from their ahwal and get from their states in us Without them, you will not be able to get it. You will just be able to read it in books about them. And that's also still, if you are lucky, uh, because nowadays people don't even want to read about these things. You know, they just want to read about halal and haram and rules and this and politics and think that is Islam. You know, so uh, we, have to, we have to search for Allah's people. And, and they are there. There's other wasfa says that they don't exist anymore. You know? And that's not true at all. They will always be there. The ulama will always be there in Islam because the deen of Allah cannot be without people who understand it. And the awliya will always be there because Allah's deen will not be without people who carry its secrets. And the muslimin will always be there. You know, Nobody can wipe out the muslimin because Islam has to continue, iman has to continue, ihsan has to continue.